Welcome to PALS, it's Prof. Sanya Wu's anatomy lecture series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you're just joining us, you have not subscribed, we would like you to please do it now and be part of this amazing anatomy family. This is a lecture series on the embryology of the heart. The lecture is divided into five parts. Part one is on the formation of the primary heart tube. Part two, which you are watching now, is on the development of the atrium or atrial chambers. Part three is on the development of the ventricles and the heart flow tract. Part four is on the clinical correlates of heart embryology. And in part five, we will test our knowledge of what we have learned in all the parts through our question and answer section, where we will answer related questions from various examination boards. Let's go to class. The formation of definitive heart with four chambers from the primitive heart tube with a single lumen is achieved through the following processes. Number one, formation of septa. Two, regression and absorption of sinus venosus in the right atrium. Absorption of pulmonary vein in the left atrium. Incorporation of bulbous cordy into the primitive ventricle and cavitation. We will start with formation of the heart septa. This is also called septation. The single lumen of the primary heart tube will be partitioned into four definitive chambers by the formation of four septa. These septa are one atrioventricular septum, interatrial septum, interventricular septum and eticopulmonary septum. We will start with formation of atrioventricular septum. The atrioventricular or AV septum will divide the atrioventricular canal into right and left atrioventricular canals. What it does is to partition the atrioventricular canal. Atrioventricular canal is a connection between the atrium and the ventricle. This septum is formed as follows. Two thickenings will appear on the atrioventricular canal, one on the dosal wall and the other on the ventral wall. These are called atrioventricular cushions or endocardial cushions or AV cushions. These cushions will grow towards each other and fuse together to form atrioventricular septum, which is also called septum intermedium, which now divides the atrioventricular canal into right and left AV canals. Failure of these cushions to fuse will cause a defect called persistent AV canal. This is common in Down's syndrome. Now, remodeling will bring the new right and left AV canals into alignment with the feature right and left ventricles. If there is failure of this realigning process, it will lead to another defect called the double inlet defect. We will take this defect in more details in our clinical correlate section. The next septum we will consider is the interatrial septum. The interatrial septum is a septum that divides the primitive atrium into the right and left atria. It will be formed by two septa. One, the septum primum, and two, the septum secundum. The first septum here, called septum primum, starts the partitioning of the primitive atrium. It is crescent in shape. It starts developing from the upper part of the primitive atrial chamber on the left side of the sinoatrial orifice. The sinoatrial orifice is the opening of the sinus venosus into the primitive atrium. This septum will then grow downwards 
towards septum intermedium, which is also called the AV septum, leaving a little gap between its lower end and then the septum intermedium. This gap of foramen is called foramen primum or ostium primum. The atria chamber now has right and left atrial chambers. Later, septum primum will fuse with AV septum or septum intermedium, sealing off the earlier opening between them, which is the foramen primum. As this is happening, the upper part of septum primum will break down, creating another entrance into the newly partitioned left atrium. The foramen thus formed is called foramen secundum or ostium secundum. A second crescent-shaped septum will also arise from the roof of primitive atrial chamber immediately to the right of septum primum here. It is called septum secundum. The septum secundum will grow downwards towards the septum intermedium again. It will overlap the foramen secundum. The right and left atria now will be communicating with each other through an oblique valvula passage between the upper margin of the septum primum here and lower margin of septum secundum here. This new passage is called foramen oval. This is an image of a fully developed heart. This is interatrial septum. Here is the fossa ovale. It represents the septum primum. This is called limbus fossa ovale. It represents the lower free edge of septum secundum. Now the big question we'll ask is why is a right to left shunt necessary as we see blood moving from the right side of the atrium to the left side of the atrium? We can notice that in the course of the formation of interatrial septum that at every point an opening between the two atria is ensured ranging from foramen primum to foramen secundum and at this point we are now foramen oval. This is because the pulmonary circulation in the fetus is not yet effective and oxygenation at this point is not in the fetal lungs but in the placenta. So oxygenated blood coming from the placenta which is delivered to the right atrium through the inferior vena cava can only enter the left atrium through these openings. After birth, foramen oval functionally closes due to high pressure in the left atrium than the right. This is called physiologic closure. About three months later, the valve of the oval foramen will fuse with the septum secundum, forming the fossa ovale or oval fossa. This is called anatomical closure. Fate of sinus venosus. The right and left horns of sinus venosus initially will be equal in size. Sinatral orifice here initially lies transverse in position. The developing sinus venosus will pass through two processes in the course of its development. One is regression of its left horn, and two is absorption of its body and right horn. We shall take each step in details. In the middle of the fourth week, the sinus venosus receives venous blood from its two horns. Each horn will receive blood from its three veins, the vitelline, the umbilical, and the common cardinal veins. 
the left vitelline and left umbilical veins will lose their connection to the sinus venosus, as we can note here. There will be development of left to right shunt between the primitive veins through communications between the anterior cardinal veins of both right and left horns, seen here. With these two events above, most of the blood that would have been drained through the left horn is now diverted through the right horn of sinus venosus. Left horn of sinus venosus will then regress to form the coronary sinus, opening into the right atrium. Now for the body, with the increase in the flow of blood through the right horn of the sinus venosus as a result of the left to right shunt between the primitive veins, it will also lead to an increase in the size of the right horn. After formation of interatrial septum, the right horn and body of sinus venosus will be absorbed and incorporated into the right atrium. The increase in the flow of blood through the right horn of the sinus venosus, which led to increase in its size, will also lead to a change in the position and orientation of the sinoatrial orifice. This orifice will now shift to right and change from a horizontal position to a vertical position. Here in the image, with the two horns passing blood, the orifice is lying horizontal. But here, the left horn is regressed. Passage is now only through the right horn and the orifice is now vertical. This vertical orifice will now be guarded by two distinct lips, the right and the left venous valves. The upper ends of the two valves will fuse to form septum spurium. The right and left venous halves will separate from each other. The left venous half and the septum spurium will fuse with the developing atrial septum. The superior portion of the right venous valve will disappear entirely. The inferior portion will develop into these three structures. One, crystal terminally here. Two, valve of inferior vena cava. And three, the valve of coronary sinus. In this image of fully developed heart, the crystal terminally here forms the dividing line between the original trabeculate part of the right atrium here and the smooth walled part called the sinus venarum here. We will also look at the fate of the veins draining into sinus venosus. The right umbilical vein will disappear completely. The right vitelline vein will form the uppermost part of inferior vena cava. The right anterior cardinal vein in its upper part will form one, the right brachiocephalic vein, the right internal jugular vein, and the upper part of superior vena cava. The transverse process formed by the right and left anterior cardinal veins will give rise to the left brachiocephalic vein. Right posterior cardinal vein will give rise to upper part vasigous vein. The left common cardinal vein will give rise to the oblique vein of the left atrium and the left posterior cardinal vein will give rise to left superior intercostal vein. The right common cardinal vein will give rise to remaining part of superior vena cava. We will now consider absorption of pulmonary veins into the left atrium. While the primitive right atrium enlarges by incorporation of right sinus horn, the primitive left atrium also enlarges and absorbs the pulmonary vein as follows. 
Here is the right atrial wall, and this is the left. A single embryonic pulmonary vein first develops as an outgrowth from the posterior part of this left wall of the left atrium here. This vein will connect with veins of the developing lung buds. The vein later divides into right and left pulmonary veins. Each of the right and left pulmonary veins further divides into two branches, making a total of four veins. These four veins, two from each side, are absorbed into the left atrium and come to open into the left atrium. The large, smooth and posterior part of the left atrium is derived from absorbed pulmonary vein. Derivatives of part of the atrium The rough, trabeculated part in front of crystal terminally is formed by primitive atrium in its right half. The smooth part, also called sinus venarium, behind the crystal terminally is formed by the sinus venosus. For the left atrium, the posterior smooth part is formed through absorption of pulmonary vein. Anterior rough part and left auricle are formed through the primitive atrium in its left half. This is where we will end this part of the lecture. If you have questions, comments or suggestions, please throw them in the comment section. And if you like the video, press the like button and share it to your friends. And together, we will build a unique anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. See you in my next video. Thank you and bye for now.